um, you have to battle through many things. As readers read, they have to pay attention to many things, to letters. They have to yeah, be familiar with the letters. And the letters make words, therefore they have to be strong in the vocabulary. They look at the illustrations to see whether what they're reading makes sense. They, they use language structures that they are familiar with and therefore arrive at a message. So reading is getting to the message of the text. Readers learn to read by reading, a skill that becomes stronger with practice. Um, it's been said that reading is a problem-solving activity uh, that becomes stronger and stronger the better reader you become, and that it is true. Uh, it is a problem-solving activity because you have so many elements to, to maneuver with, letters, vocabulary, illustration, language, to get at the message. So when thinking about teaching reading, we often focus on phonics. So what is phonics? What do you think? Could you respond? All of the above. <laughs> Concepts of print, letter knowledge, phonological awareness. What is phonics? Blending and decoding, all of the above. I, yeah, I agree, all of the above. So let's go on with the slide that we'll talk about, phonics. Phonics is concepts of print, which we will discuss. We'll also discuss phonological awareness, also letter knowledge, also blending and decoding. What are concepts of print? At the beginning, when children are being exposed to language, they're read to, and what, what they hear are picture books. So generally, they, uh, they associate a story with the pictures because they've been following the pictures as, it, as the book is being told to them. Uh, when they start learning to read, they realize that it's the print that carries the message. Um, that it, it is an actual step that has to be, get uh, passed. Then they recognize, they have to recognize that print represents spoken sounds. You have these letters and they all are symbols and they represent sounds. Other smaller items, they recognize the cover and the title page. They can determine when a, where a story starts where it ends. They recognize word boundaries, that is the space between words. I, they identify capital and lowercase letters and one-to-one -one correspondence. All of these are elements of concepts of print, as well as recognizing high-frequency words um, and so forth. So let's, let's see how we would teach concepts of print using poetry. This is a little chant. I really like to use chants and poetry with children because it's an, a choral activity. Uh, children gather together and all together they recite something. And it's not a single person being singled out and they might be shy. This, they do all together and they chant together and no inhibitions. So the teacher will present this, a chart with a, a, a poem or a chant and um, She'll start with the title and say, this is the title, I use a pencil. As she reads the title, she points to each word, I use a pencil. Um, the first time I, I tried doing this, reading, pointing to each word, was a little bit tricky for me. <laughs> One is not used to reading while pointing to each word, but so it takes a little bit of practice, but it's a good practice because we're teaching one-to-one -one correspondence, and we're teaching directionality. You start to the left and you flow to the right, then it's a left-hand sweep. So then you start with the poem. I use a brown pencil, I use it to write. I use a brown pencil, I use it to write. I write my numbers and I write my name. I use a brown pencil, I use it to write. So as the teacher reads this poem, uh, the teacher points to each word each single word, then we can, um, and the children repeat this and they become familiar with the chant and uh, first they simply enjoy it. Then we come to some teaching elements to developing concepts of print with chants. We ask questions. So first 
the song is or chant is introduced and the kids get engaged. They really get engaged when, when, they're, when it's a real rhythmic or fun chant. And then the teacher can say, point to the title. And so they already know what the title is and they point to the title. Where do I start to read? Uh-huh, so they point to the very first word, which in this case was I. I used a brown pencil. And where, which way do I go? So they have to flow to the right. And when they reach the end of the sentence, you ask, and now? And they have to show the left hand sweep. So point to a capital letter, point to a period. Let's count the words in the sentence. And the teacher shows, uh, raising a hand, using fingers to count words. She says, let's count the words in this sentence. I use a brown pencil. Use your fingers to count. I use a brown pencil. Yeah, I use a br <laughs> brown pencil. So uh, we're using our fingers to count words in a sentence. Then point to the first word in this sentence. Point to the last word in this sentence. There's a high frequency word in this chant and the high frequency word is I. They have been taught I. So you say, you know I, point to I. Then you highlight a sentence. In this case, we highlight the sentence, I write my name. I write my name. So then you ask the children, say name. What sound do you hear at the beginning of name? Mm. Find name, and so they look through the words to the one that starts with an N. So this can be done even before a child knows how to read the word name. They predict that the one that starts with a N sound is the word name. So now using poetry to teach phonemic awareness. Young learners have little awareness of the sounds they articulate when speaking. The little uh, children, as, as they communicate and they ask for things, comment on things, it's just words that they're saying uh, with meaning, but they're not aware of each particular individual sound. It's in school uh, or through chants and poetry at home, with, through rhyme and rhythm in poems and chants, as well as in music, these engage the young learner and make makes them aware of sounds in words. We're going to see how that happens in, in a little minute. And then in school, uh, we uh, further phonological awareness activities develop sound awareness, tasks like identifying initial, medial, and final sounds. It's important uh, for the children to know that there's a sequence of sounds in words. Okay, this is an example of how children become aware of sounds in words. It's a fun little poem, it's, it's short, it's sweet, it's funny, and it makes children want to en be engaged and, and join in and repeat it over and over again and take it home and say to mom and dad, this is Fuzzy Wuzzy. Fuzzy Wuzzy was a bear. Fuzzy Wuzzy had no hair. So, Fuzzy Wuzzy wasn't fuzzy, was he? <laughs> I hope you liked it, because I think children, well, I know that children really do. And so what do they become aware of? Rhyme, bear, hair, fuzzy, wuzzy, wuzzy. Yes? So this is when they first become aware that there are sounds in words. Learning with chants and songs. We know that chants and songs engage the students. They encourage students to join in. By doing so, they practice saying new words and they learn new concepts. So it, it really is true, especially, especially for second language learners, but even uh, for first their own native language uh, speakers. Um, pronunciation, articulation goes through different uh, stages. Uh, and so the more they speak, the, the more they practice articulation and the better the words are. And as well, um, the better the, uh, children articulate words, the better they are at writing each sound in sequence. So by chanting and singing songs, it, it develops that, that skill. So also some poems, especially in, in uh, Reach Higher, uh, they teach new concepts, such as 
in this chant over here. It tells a story. What, what concept are we teaching? We're teaching sequencing. First, next, and then. The words first, next, and then. This is a skill we need to teach young learners. Sequence, when, the sequence of events. So, the little duckling. Listen and chant. First, the little duckling hatches in a nest. Mother duck says he's not like the rest. Next, the bigger ducklings don't want to play. And the little duckling cries. Then he runs away. Finally, he's happy swimming in the pond, for now the little duckling has turned, has grown into a swan. Um, so we, there, there are different sequence, definite sequences here. We can talk about first and what happens next and then and then finally last. And it's again a chance for, for, for the children, first and second language learners, to repeat words uh, and articulate. Um, uh, children learn to read by reading, as I said, but they also uh, learn to speak by speaking. And in this event, they're, they're repeating a chant and a song. Phonemic awareness. So what is phonemic awareness? Uh, I've been teaching or, and involved in education for such a long time. I remember a time when phonemic awareness wasn't even talked about. It was in the mid-90s, around 95, 96, 1995, last century, 1995, 1996, when suddenly we started writing about phonemic awareness into teacher's guides. Before that, it was just simply the letters, learn the letters, and somehow you learn how to read. But now, from then on, we have been focusing on phonemic awareness. And so what is it? It's the ability to hear, identify, and manipulate individual sounds. In spoken words. So hear them, the, z, identifying z, z, uh, z, and manipulating them. So children who have phonemic awareness skills are likely to have an easier time learning to read and spell than children who have few or none of these skills. So I'm going to talk about different um, strategies to teach phonemic awareness. Uh, always remembering that once that skill is learned, we don't have to keep on teaching it. Um, we've learned it and we go on. As I said, uh, when we were doing, I teach a brown, I, I use a brown pencil. I was using my hand to count the words in I use a brown pencil. Use your fingers. Use your fingers to count the words in a sentence uh, for many reasons. Number one, <laughs> words. The term words. How can you explain to young children what is a word? You can't really explain it. You can't really explain to little young children what is a sentence. But uh, you can use them. You can count words and therefore that way um, count those well, what words? Okay, so we use fingers to count words and we clap for syllables. So let's clap for fuzzy. Fuzzy. Let's clap for wuzzy. Wuzzy. Let's clap for word. Word. I mean, let's clap for word. Bear. Bear. Uh, it's, it's difficult to uh, initially for children to identify syllables. It's, 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 uh, it's tricky. Um, they might do bear. Or they might do fuzzy. So little by little, by practicing just two or three words a day, two or three words a day, uh, clapping syllables is plenty. And once they, they can do that, then we stop doing that because they've learned it. Um, children learn to say a word slowly using sound boxes, starting with words made of continuous sounds. Okay, let's see what that's all about. Let me read some chats here. Ah, interesting sound. Sequencing is interesting. Okay. Ah, what do we have here? We have a picture of a sun. <clears throat> Imagine that it's on a card note, something like this. And at the top, at the top, you draw a picture of the sun. And underneath it, you draw <clears throat> the three boxes. 
And then you learn, <clears throat> you, you tell the children, let's say sun slowly. What is this? It's a sun. Let's say sun slowly. Okay, they don't understand. What do you mean say sound slowly? The, the purpose of this is for the children to be aware that there's a sequence of sounds in words and that one sound is first, one is a medial sound, and one is a last sound. That's the only, we're not spelling, we're just making children aware that there are sequences of sounds. It just so happens that sun has three letters. But if we could do foot, and if we did foot, that actually is with four letters, but there's only three sounds. So we're, all, we're not spelling with this activity. All we're doing is having the children recognize that there's a sequence of sounds. There's a mid, first one and there's a last sound and there in sounds in the middle. Okay, so how do we teach that? We say, well, I'm going to teach you how to do, say uh, sun slowly. Sun. Good. Now you do it. Initially, they will say, sun. Okay, something tricked you there. Watch. So you demonstrate again. You demonstrate doing, saying sun slowly. Then they will, generally, this is the pattern that usually happens. They will do sun. Okay, that's, that's good try. Good try. Let's try it again. And so you always demonstrate again. You demonstrate. Then they will finally get it. Sun. Sun. Great. Put your finger under the first uh, square chip. Good. Put your finger under the last chip. Good. It's important to identify first and last because for children, it just looks like a row of boxes and it doesn't necessarily uh, mean directionality because you're just barely learning directionality left to right. So we, we have to teach which is the first box and which is the last box. Yeah. Um, we use these counters, these counters, we use buttons, we can use coins, anything that can slide easily into the boxes. So hearing sounds in words using sound boxes. Let's review that. So you use words with three to four sounds. That's plenty. Three to four sounds is enough. Um, because, as I say, and I repeat, they're only learning initial sounds and last final sounds, and what's in the middle comes later. Three to four sounds um, is enough to teach what, what you hear at the beginning of sun. Now, you use words with continuous initial sounds. I, I think that this is important because an initial continuous sound is easier to hear and identify. You say sun, you can say foot, you can say Hat. So you can hear those initial sounds more easily than such a thing as cat, cat. Well, the cut is not continuous sound. It, it just is very abrupt and goes by very quickly. And so in order to teach the concept of initial sound, to me, it is so much wiser to use a continuous sounding word. And uh, use words that you can illustrate. That's important because when you're doing this activity, sometimes children, or often, they forget the word that they're saying slowly. And therefore, if you have the picture, it makes it easier for them. While saying the word slowly, push a chip into each corresponding box, as you see. Then ask, what is the first sound you hear in sun? As, and as you ask this, you point to the first box. And again, emphasizing what is the first box. And what do you hear next? And what do you hear last? Now, I once was doing this with a, a child. I was examining, testing this child to, to how much they know, or what do they know, what do they do know. And I asked, what is the first sound you hear at the beginning of cat? And the child said, meow. <laughs> Why did they say meow? Because they really didn't know what I was asking. They had not maybe done this practice before. They didn't understand what I, w I wanted to hear. 
they heard the word cat and they heard the word meow, I mean sound, and so the only logical thing to say is meow. Um, by doing this activity, it becomes very clear. It is an easy way to demonstrate what is the first sound. Okay. Okay, this is a, a chance for you to practice. What is this? This is an egg. Uh -huh. So when you go home later on, go to this page and go to the page of the sun and practice. This is sun. Let's say sun. Let's say egg slowly. Say egg slowly. Egg. What is? What do you, show me. Where is the first box? Show me. Point to the first box. Point to the last box. What? Did, what is the sound you hear at the beginning of egg? Say it slowly. Egg. Okay. Egg. And what is the last sound? Now, initial continuous sounds in English are all of these. You know that the vowels are, are sounds that you can stretch. Ah, eh, eh. Those are stretchable sounds. And all the rest of them, f fan, fish, those are stretchable sounds. Moon, rose, and so forth, so forth. So, uh, Using these sounds over here, continuous sounds, what can be illustrated? Words such as sun, moon, foot, hand. And what a nice way to learn to articulate something like hand. Especially for second language learners. For example, a word like train, train, train. If they know how to, if they know how to use the sound boxes, train. The sound boxes will help them train, um, pronounce those words, especially words with blends. Blends are wonderful to uh, to learn with sound boxes. So these are the pictures that you can illustrate that are made of continuous sounds: leg, uh, nest, etc. So. Progress in hearing sounds and words. Initially, at first, the child will need boxes, a picture, and chips. Once they have learned that, it's just oral. Um, no longer do you need, you've learned that. You no longer need the chips. You, you, know, the, you know what the thing is all about. You write down the sounds that you hear first and next and last. So once the task is learned, the activity becomes just oral. At the end, the analysis becomes silent. So the key components of foundational skills, we've gone through phonological awareness, we're into phonics, then vocabulary, fluency, and comprehension. We will discuss all of them. Okay, alphabet knowledge. Alphabet knowledge, specifically letter naming, has historically been among the reading readiness skills used for the prediction of reading achievement. You need to learn letters to read. Frequently, when you see a child struggling through a text, frequently it's insecure letter knowledge. So we want the children to be really, really good at, at learning their letters and at recognizing them automatically. So you can use an ABC chart. An ABC chart, I will briefly show it to you. This is one that I made for my class. So we can go back. And what do we want the children to do? To recite the letters like while pointing to each one. So let's say you have an uppercase and you have a lowercase and you have an object like A, A, apple. After saying the name of the letter, point to the object that starts with that letter and name it. A, A, apple. And the child will point to the uppercase A, lowercase A, and to the apple. Now, what are they learning? They're learning two things. They're learning the A name. And it's important to, to know the name because that's the long sound of the A. So if they're writing a word such as name, name, A, they hear the name of the A and they use it in writing. And they also learn the short A, apple, apple. In, in English, the vowels are very, very tricky. So it's important to learn the name of the letter 
and the sound of the letter, because they will need both. Yeah, as opposed to Spanish, for example, a a avión. Uh, the name of the letter is the same as its sound. So when finished, ask children to show. Ah, yes. So they have read the ABC chart. They have pointed to each of the letters and to each of the objects, and they finished. So then what do we do? Ah, we review where, where the letters are in the alphabet. Show me the R. Show me the A. They become familiar with the ABC chart, uh, slowly, slowly learning to realize that there's certain letters that come at the beginning, certain letters come at the end, certain letters are sort of in the middle, and, that, and a facility looking for them. Show me the A, show me the T, show me the Z. Yeah. Then I, I find it quite useful uh, using uh, children's names uh, very frequently. Um, children can identify children's names because they look at the initial letter. Show me the letter you hear at the beginning of Sam. Show me the letter you hear at the beginning of Matt, etc., etc. So using uh, children's names is good to practice the ABC chart and show me the letter here at the beginning of table then you start wandering around the classroom pointing to different things and finding uh, objects that they can look for okay this is the ABC chart I did it was my choice to write the lowercase first and then the uppercase because I find that lowercase is much more uh, commonly used than uppercase so it's A, A, ant, B, B, bear, C, C, cat. And they go through the alphabet. Yes, naming all of them. And it's tricky. It's tricky. It takes a while. But let's see how much time, how much time do I spend on the ABC chart? Reciting it and asking a few, three to four minutes is about it. Uh, clapping for syllables, one minute. You use a word from a poem or you use somebody's name. Um, the the sound, hearing sounds in words activities of pushing the chips, three minutes. So we don't spend terribly much long time in this. This is it. Very quick, brief, get in there. Otherwise, you practice it every day. So you don't need to teach everything on the first day. Okay, these are magnetic letters that we can use uh, to uh, build words. They're, they're learning the words with the ABC chart, then they use magnetic letters to build and make words. So making words, which is also blending. The children, for, the, for this type of an activity, I, do, I can't use the whole class because I need to observe and what the children are doing. I, I need to be evaluating the children at every instance. And to this activity, for, for let's say 20 children, it's just too much. So separate. Uh, anything that I do in literacy, I separate into children who are having difficulties and children who are speeding right along. So you're sitting at the table and I give them a piece of construction paper, a colored piece of paper, and I give them certain letters. Everyone has the same set of letters. So in this case, it is A, M, S, T. They put that at the top of their paper. And uh, I say, say am slowly, am, show me am. So they pull down the corresponding letters, place them on the paper, and then always read it with your finger. It's very important to read it with your finger. The finger is very, very important in early uh, literacy learning. Put your finger under the last letter again. De identifying a last letter as opposed to a first letter is tricky. So put your finger under the last letter. If they get it on the, they put it on the first letter, you direct them to the last letter. Last letter. Let's change that letter to make a new word. Say at. What do you hear at the end? Change the last letter to make at. Read it with your finger. So they put away the M, they put the T, then they read it with your finger. At. Let's add a letter to say a new word, to make a new word. Say sat. Add, add the letter you hear at the beginning of sat. Read it with your finger. Sat. And from then on, you can make other words like hat, hat. 
uh, put your finger under the first letter. Let's change that letter to make hat. So they remove the S. Oh, sorry, we don't have a hat here. Anyway. Yeah. These are cards, letter cards, and these are magnetic letters. All of these we can use for making words and for blending the sounds into words. Um, this is a chain, a chain to practice with. You can practice, again, we started with, with am, so at, show me at, show me at, read it with your finger. Now say sat, what, what sound do you hear at the beginning of sat? Let's add that sound to make sat, read it with your finger. Put your finger under the first letter. Let's change that first letter to make hat. Read it with your finger, hat. So as you see, we're really, really blending. We're practicing letter knowledge and we're blending. And we're making all of this, we're, we're starting with a known word, let's say, and we're making new words. Uh, these are high frequency words. High frequency words are really need to be taught in English. English is such a tricky, <laughs> tricky language for me, uh, maybe for children, uh, because, for example, the word the it's such a high frequency word, but you can't decode it. You can't say t h a, t h a, and come up with a meaning. You have to learn it automatically. Boof, that's it. Automatically, you can recognize it in text, in print. You can write it quickly without thinking about it. So we want to teach it in such a way that it'll become burned into their uh, memory. Same as my, my. So if, if they know the, and they've learned the, they can get to them, and then change the M to then, and then change the N to they, y, y, y. My can get them to buy, try, fly, sky, and see, to tree, free, three, etc., and all of these. Two is a high frequency word, such a little word, but two, uh, it should be maybe T U, but it isn't, it's T O. And if you know two, then you know do. So learning high frequency words. How do you teach a high frequency word? You display it, display the word. So you show a card with the word the. You say the word, the. You explain the word. In this case, I can't explain it, but I can use it in a sentence. The book is on the table. Has, have the children say the word, then they spell it. Say the, T-H-E, the. And then have the children use the word in a sentence. Then, this has been oral, have them write it. Get a, get a wipeable, um, chalk, chalkboard or any kind of write on wipe off board and have them write it up high, write it down low, write it in the middle and check it. Check it. If it's if something tricked them, take a look at it. Spell it again. T H E the. Try it again. Write it up high, write it down low. You can have you can play my pile, your pile. You have a stack of high frequency words. If they get it, they keep the card. If they don't, you keep the card. It's my pile. So, and then word walls. I like to have high frequency words posted on the wall so that as they're writing independent writing or so forth, they can always check the wall um, to get at the word. Um, so on your own, you can practice teaching the, these high frequency words, the, she, one, are, two, does, how. Say the word. Use the word. And the children say the word. They spell the word. They use the word. And they write it up high, down low, in the middle. Check it. Mm, something tricked you. Try it again. Quickly. And then find it in, in, let's say you're doing a chant or a poem. You have a text right there. Have them find high frequency words in the middle of that text. So fluency. Fluency leads to comprehension. What is fluency? How does a, re a reader achieve fluency? Automaticity leads to fluency. 
as I've been talking about high frequency words, we want the children to have automatically to recognize high frequency words, to automatically recognize the sounds of letters. So a reader learns to read by reading. The more children read, the better they get at it. Their letter recognition becomes automatic. Their high frequency word recognition becomes automatic. They become familiar with chunks. There are some chunks that are not decodable in English or not easily decodable. So you want them to become familiar with them and just to read through them. GHT, for example, night, right, sight, light. Yeah, the GHT, ING, ED, chunks. So as they read, their vocabulary expands. And as their vocabulary expands, so does their comprehension, yes? So they become fluent readers who read to get at the message of the text. Uh, in Reach Higher, for example, before reading a selection, they learn vocabulary. In, in this case, it is science vocabulary, and it deals with a plant. The story they're going to read is about the birth, the birth of, a, of a flower. So they're introduced to parts of a plant, flower, sun, petal, leaf, bud, seed. These are parts of a plant. So look at this living plant and talk about its plants, uh, parts. The story that they are about to read is also a folktale. So you explain what is a folktale. What happens in the folktale? A folktale has a plot. A plot is what happens in a story. It's a story about a seed that's asleep. It's a lazy this lazy seed who doesn't want to come out and play with the sun and the, the wind. And so, and finally, the seed becomes a flower. The reading strategy that we want the children to develop is monitoring. Monitor your reading, what happens to the seed. So they follow the actions of the seed throughout the story. I didn't put the whole story here, but just just one section of it where it shows how they are using the vocabulary. Bud, leaf, and stem. The door. Oh, oh yes, this is when the door opens and the seed finally decides to come out and play. <laughs> so the door opens, a leaf grows, then a little bud, one petal opens, then many more open. So they're introduced to the vocabulary, they use the vocabulary, and uh, they read the vocabulary. And having read this, they read the book over and over again, the story over and over again. It, it um, reinforces their vocabulary knowledge. Writing. Writing is so important to go with reading. Read, writing is as important as reading instruction. So whatever you do in writing supports reading and vice versa. And please, it is essential that talk is essential to writing. Um, if you ask a young child to write about something, you have to have a conversation first. You talk, you talk about flowers, let's say, and for plants. To give them something to hang on to start, to, to start writing. Okay, what types of writing are there? Uh, they're shared writing. That's when the teacher thinks out loud and demonstrates demonstrates their th the thinking process, which leads to her writing a sentence or a note to the parents or something. Independent writing is incredibly important because it is something totally independent. It's, it's a time when a child explores the writing process, writing independently in response to a reading or a class discussion. It could be a journal entry. And it is something that the child feels free to explore. There's nothing wrong or absolutely correct and it's it's just this is your writing this is this is where you are and this is where you express and show your growth power writing <clears throat> is something that is uh, very important because very frequently students have a hard time starting to write they're given a pencil a piece of paper and uh, they have a topic they've discussed it but they have a hard time starting Power writing is an activity that takes one minute, just one minute. Um, 
Children write as much as they can, as well as they can, in one minute to build stamina. Let me read a little bit of this chat. Um, so power writing is practice to get started. So the, let's say one day they, they write something, they count the words, it's seven words. Aha! Uh -huh. So next day they have to do better. They have to do eight words. So they, they're motivated to, to write. Interactive writing is, I'm going to explain that because it's about my favorite, my favorite activity that reviews so much. Children together write a meaningful message. They practice counting words in a sentence, initial caps, final periods, uh, space between the words, hearing sounds in words, phonics, and it's an excellent opportunity for the teacher to observe this as their strengths as they, as they develop. Back to power writing. Power writing builds stamina and automaticity in, in student writing. They draw pictures or write words or letters and sentences and ideas in time segments. So what the teacher can say is, write all the words you can in one minute, or look at this picture, write all you can about it. Yeah? And so they try to do better and better each day. Interactive writing. Interactive writing, uh, not with a whole class, with maybe a maximum of 10 students because the teacher is, is observing uh, what the students are doing. The, the students are either on the floor with their tablet or at the table with their tablet and the teacher is up front with an easel where there's a large sheet of paper where the writing ha will happen. It's a small group activity. Students have their own erasable tablet. The teacher is able to watch each student. After a conversation, children decide on a meaningful message. Children count the words in a sentence. Again, we're counting words in a sentence with our fingers and identify the first word. Children write the initial sound or the whole word, depending on their level. And the writing continues, either sound by sound or word by word, leaving spaces between words, rereading written text to say the next word. Okay, let's demonstrate this. Ah. What do you get out of, what, what benefits? Allow students to practice concept of print, directionality, initial capital letter, final period, space between words, letter sound correspondence, arriving at a meaningful message, writing and rereading that message. The importance of writing. Writing makes one think and clarify one's thoughts and opinions. Okay, this is an example of um, very early in the year. Um, if the school is on year round, they start school in August. If it's more of a traditional uh, school year, they will start in early September. So this looks to me like if it's a year round, it's in the, about the middle of August. Um, when um, yeah, yeah. Okay. We were reading a story about a fish, a fish, and the, it was a, actually a song. It was a song about a, a fox and a fish. And the fox wanted to go to the river and catch some fish. But the fish hid, and the fox had to get away. So we discussed the song, we sang the song many times, and we decided to come up with a meaningful message. And so they, somebody said, I like to eat fish. Oh, okay. Uh, do you want to write that? Yeah, let's write that. What are we going to write? I like to eat fish. I like to eat fish. Okay, let's count the words. We have to repeat the sentence several times because they forget what they want to write. I like to eat fish. Let's count it with our finger. fingers. I like to eat fish. Good. How many words? Five. What's the first word? I. Good. So each of the children are sitting down writing that first word. They're practicing and they'll say, I'm, I'm done. I'm finished. But they've written it only once. Write it again. Again, write it 10 times. Write it 20 times. Because in the meantime, that one child has to come up to the easel and write the word. You see that in the bottom crease there, there is a line. 
and below the line it's a practice space not only a practice space but a place where i put the names of the children that i've been writing the first name i believe is joshua i think it's in purple and so joshua writes in purple i do this so that i can observe what what the children are capable how the children are growing and their strengths and then i can use this as um, observation tool so as everybody is writing I I I I in their paper and this this child uh, Joshua as you can see there's a lower lowercase I so I oh Joshua wrote the lowercase I but then we got to the fact that I uh, as a word is is a cap it's a capital letter so he practices a, a, a capital letter and then writes it up at the top of the page Let's read what you wrote. I. What comes next? I like. We see that this is really early in the year because each sound is written separately by a different person. They, they, they don't really write whole words yet. They're early in their learning. So the next word is like. Say like slowly. L. So everybody, write what you hear. So everybody in their little boards, they're writing the L, la, 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 la. And Rebecca uh, was the first to finish and wrote it correctly. And so I asked Rebecca to come up front. I write her name in orange, let her practice a little bit down at the bottom, and have her write her letter. Good. Right, go and sit down. Now let's read what we have. I, what's next? I, I, I. Oh, I. Mm. So what do you hear? And everybody's writing the I, I, I. And I ask, I can't read this. <laughs> but this person in green comes up, practices or not. She was very uh, good at writing it, so doesn't need to practice. So she writes the K. Now you see that there's an E in black. Uh, so we know that each child has her or his own color to write with and the E uh, in black and all the rest of the black letters are for letters that the children do not know that they are there or, or what, what letters there should be. So like has a silent E at the back and if this is too early the children don't know it is a silent E. They have not learned the word like as a high frequency word yet. So the teacher adds the letter. And if they ask, why did you put that there? Then you say, at the beginning, you say, because it looks good. There's no, no reason to explain that when the vowel says its name, then you write the E at the back. So let's, um, we have the word like written down. So we go back to read, I like. What comes next? Two. Two is a high frequency word and um, they have not learned it yet as you can see but they can hear the first sound what do you hear at the beginning of two write it write it everybody's writing it and then the teacher adds the o because the children are not able to get to it let's read it i like to eat eat what it, what do they hear in eat they hear the e but they do not hear the a therefore the teacher adds the a and fish they hear f a, but they do not yet know sh, so the teacher adds the sh. I like to eat fish. Okay, so we can see that this is early in the year. Hmm, this is a little bit 5th of September. They must have started hmm, uh, five or six weeks ago. So what do we hear? My fish is fast. We went through a conversation. We're still talking about fish. Um, they know the word my, as, as it's obvious. They know my as a high frequency word. They must have learned it when they've learned the, their first consonant, which is the M. Uh, I believe in, in teaching continuous sounding uh, letters first, M, S, H, F. I do not believe in just teaching uh, alphabetical order. So my came with the letter M. And um, again, the SH is written by the teacher in in black. Uh, all the rest is fast that children were able to get to all of those sounds and decode and then read. 
Uh, oh yes, uh, I did not use an initial cap at the beginning of the year. I do not teach that the first letter of the first word of a sentence needs to be capitalized because that's just an overload of information. Once the children are more familiar with writing a sentence, that might be pretty soon, maybe in October, I will say, okay, now the first letter of the first word of a sentence needs to be capitalized. Uh, this is in December. I like to hug my teacher. Okay, now we're writing full words. I like to. All of these are high frequency words, my. So they wrote, wrote it automatically. And as you see down below the line, we have the date, but you don't, they have not been practicing how to write it because they're already so fluent in writing. Hug is a word that they could say and identify the sounds. I like picking berries for my mom. This is end of September. All, they, they, all that they could not get to was added by the teacher. Um, so berries, and this is a chunk. Picking, they couldn't get, we haven't taught that yet. Uh, this is for first grade, this was in kindergarten. This was in kindergarten that I was doing it, and I think um, um, sometimes it goes on to first grade. It just depends on the level of the students. Um, I, I start doing uh, interactive writing the second day of school because I think it is so wonderful. It is such a wonderful teaching tool. It, to me, I, somebody says awesome, I do think it's awesome. Um, the little otter likes to eat on his back. So this is in April. And Jessica, yes, she was a smart little girl. Uh, she was a second language learner. Uh, I had half class, the Spanish speakers. And Jessica was in the English group, but she was uh, in home, a Spanish speaker. So uh, she was able to write the entire sentence. Uh, the is high frequency word. Little is also. Otter likes high frequency word to eat on his back. She, look, look at the word back. She, she was awesome. <laughs> um, yes. Okay. So before I finish, I'd like, I, I wrote down what I would like you to remember in particular. Interactive writing is a great way to observe the students, to observe their progress and the, the samples, their work is easily you can show it to parents and share uh, the, the strengths of each one. So interactive writing not only teaches something, but for the, for the teacher, it is a, a wonderful observation tool. Also, I would like to uh, remind you that self-correction is the best way of teaching. If a child, whoops, made a little mistake, one, one could say, oh, something tricked you, try that again. We can repeat that two or three times. Try it again, something tricked you. Then eventually, if they don't get it, you have to give them the answer. But it is so easy to just simply correct them and move on. But that doesn't teach anything. 